Hi, everybody. Welcome to Unpacking the Black Box, Spatial Data Science Methods Explained. Uh, I'm Lauren Bennett, and I am joined during this hour with my colleague, Alberto Nieto. Uh, and we're going to be really digging into how um, two specific sets of methods um, within the very large set of spatial data science methods um, really work, uh, how you can interpret them, and explore the results and understand them and hopefully help you feel confident that you can use these methods um, to do really important analysis. So before we jump into it, I want to start by just talking a little bit about what spatial data science is within ArcGIS. Um, we think about it as having these kind of core components. There's the data engineering piece where we are kind of preparing our data for analysis. Not the most exciting part of the process, but arguably the mo one of the most important for sure. Um, there's visualization and exploration where we, you know, map and chart our data to understand things like distribution, both spatially and in attribute space. Um, we also use visualization and exploration to explore the results of our analysis and also to communicate. Um, then there's spatial analysis. This is kind of a big, um, a big bucket component that encompasses all sorts of techniques to do things like pattern detection, spatiotemporal pattern mining, um, prediction and predictive analysis, uh, terrain modeling and suitability modeling. Um, really all of the different ways that we ask questions and solve problems using spatial data. There's also this sub component or category of machine learning and AI. It's a particular set of algorithms and methods that are really very data driven um, and help us solve problems in really new and exciting ways. There's also big data analytics. So this is where we take advantage of the capabilities to parallelize and distribute our computing so that we can analyze massive both feature and raster or imagery data sets uh, to really scale up our analysis. Um, underlying all of this is the ability to model and to script these workflows. Um, that's particularly important to our Dev Summit audience. Um, being able to string these workflows together uh, to automate them, to operationalize them, all really important pieces here. And then also sharing and collaborating, being able to, uh, to both, you know, create, let's say, a service that someone else can use who doesn't know anything about GIS but can, under the hood, be running some sophisticated analysis. This also includes the transparency and reproducibility that's increasingly important in spatial data science. Um, this also includes communicating the results of our analysis, really being able to explain um, and share the results of our analysis to decision makers um, and stakeholders so that they can understand it and so that it can drive action. Now, within this set of components, three kind of, I think in many ways, belong as one. <laughs> Um, we break out machine learning and AI and big data analytics as their own components here because there's a, a ton of R&D going on here. We're working really hard to make sure that kind of the latest and greatest makes its way into ArcGIS and that you can take advantage of it to solve the, the problems that you're facing. Uh, but ultimately, it's really all spatial analysis. It's all spatial data science. All of these things fall into one bucket. It doesn't matter what algorithm you're using. It doesn't matter how big or small your data is. Really, spatial analysis is about solving problems, and machine learning and AI and, and big data analytics are just um, components, almost techno they're, they're, they're critical, but ultimately the goal is about solving problems. So I will just say kind of quickly, the I just want to stress the importance here of focusing on solving problems and, and really what the problem is that you're trying to solve. You really don't want to find yourself, you know, we're going to talk about um, density-based clustering today and we're going to talk about uh, forest-based classification regression, um, which is an implementation of the random forest algorithm. You don't want to learn about these methods and then find yourself walking around saying, well, now I know how to use random forest. I'm looking for a problem. You know, you really ideally have a problem you want to solve, and sometimes density-based clustering or random forest will be 
the the best tool for the job. Um, but it won't always be. And so really making sure it's kind of question and problem first and then finding the best methods and not the other way around, which I think is a really, it's kind of human nature. It's really easy for us to, you learn something new, you're excited to, to use it. And suddenly it's, it's, you're walking around, you got a hammer and everything just starts looking like nails, even when maybe they aren't. So um, just being aware of that's really important. So with that disclaimer, I want to talk a little bit about the idea that um, these machine learning tools, which certainly are a huge part of spatial data science and this, this very exciting field of data science in general, um, this idea that ArcGIS has actually a, a surprising amount of machine learning tools, many of which I think people didn't even realize were machine learning tools and have been there for, for quite a few years, actually. Um, we think about a lot of the kinds of problems that people trying to solve within machine learning um, in these kind of broader categories of classification, prediction, and clustering. And we're going to talk a little bit actually about um, all of these on some level today. Um, Alberto is going to talk later about prediction and classification using the forest-based class classification and regression tool. Um, and I'm going to start by talking about clustering. And, and just know that we're showing you really just two tools, but there are tons of tools that fall into these categories um, and we'll point you to places where you can learn more um, later on at the end of the workshop. Um, so there's lots, lots of possibilities here and I'm going to start by talking about density-based clustering. Now you can think about density-based clustering, it's like finding these natural clusters that exist in our data, finding places where points are clumping together Oftentimes, it's clumps that we can kind of visually see, um, but not necessarily quantify. And certainly, while it's useful that we can see them or that they might make sense to us when we do see them, um, automating the detection of those clumps is quite challenging. And so density-based clustering really automates the detection of that clumping or that natural clustering within our data. And we've actually implemented it using three different algorithms. And we're going to talk a little bit uh, about each of them. So here we have a kind of uh, an example set of points. And you can picture that what we're looking for are these natural clusters in that data. And then some points are going to fa fall in some cases outside of clusters and be marked as what we call noise. And interestingly, I think sometimes the noise can be um, just as interesting as the clusters. You know, those are those are in some ways these spatial outliers that don't fall into these natural clusters and why don't they? It's just as interesting sometimes. Um, but definitely the focus is finding those, those clumps or clusters. So we've implemented this using three different methods. There's DB scan, which you can think about as a defined distance um, method or approach to this. There's HDB scan, which we think about as kind of self-adjusting. It's certainly the most data-driven of the approaches. Um, and then there's optics, which is very much multi-scale. And uh, the way we think about it, it's, it's got the most ability to fine-tune the results um, as the analyst. And we'll explore each of these. So for, for DB scan, essentially what you do when you run DB scan is you give it two things. You give it a number of features that is required to be considered a cluster. So in this case, we might say, okay, I need to have, there need to be um, four neighbors, four clusters, in a, four points in addition to myself in a particular cluster in order to be considered a cluster. If I can't find them, then, then it's not a cluster. I also give it a distance. Um, the distance within which I expect to be able to find that number of points. And if within that distance I can't find that number of points, then that, is, then that point is not part of a cluster. So visually we can see, okay, let's say I said um, our cluster needs to have five points in it. And um, we calculate what we call a core distance. So it's the distance at which from that point location that we're analyzing the distance at which we get to the five point cluster and then we compare that distance that core distance to what we call the search distance which is the distance that you've input now if your core distance is smaller than the search distance you set then that means we were able within that search distance to find the number of um, points that were set as the number of points for a cluster alternatively and those points all get marked as part of a cluster Alternatively, starting at another location, 
we can see that the core distance, the distance at which we find the, that five point cluster is now much larger than our search distance. And because of that, these points will actually get marked as noise. They're not part of a cluster. So we go through and use that number of features and the distance to determine which features are per part of clusters and which features are part of, uh, are, are marked as noise. Now, the next method is called HDB scan. And HDB scan is, we call it self-adjusting. It's very much a data-driven approach. Essentially, what, what it does is it uses this series of nested clusters and it chooses which level within each of those nested clusters is going to optimally create the most stable clusters that incorporate as many members as possible. So you want clusters that are big, but you want to incorporate as many as, so as, as many members as you can without incorporating noise. So as soon as you start incorporating noise, it's like, okay, this cluster is too big. We need to separate. Um, now there's great documentation by the, um, the creators of HDB scan, which uh, we link out to in our documentation. So I'd highly recommend that if you want to really dig in deep to this data driven approach, it's very effective. Now you'll notice there's a difference between the main difference between HDB scan and DB scan. HDB scan is hierarchical. So what that means is that HDB scan allows for the density of clusters to vary across space. So with uh, with DB scan, what we saw was you set a distance, that search distance. So no matter where you are in your study area, that search distance is going to define what it means to be a cluster. So let's say you have a set study area that has both kind of um, very urban, very dense data, and then maybe you go out to suburban and now it's slightly less dense. Well, what might be a cluster in the suburban area is not going to meet necessarily the same specifications that a cluster in the urban area might meet. Now with DB scan, that means that the suburban area could all get marked as noise, right? Because you're, you have to set one definition of density, kind of points per area to be a cluster. With HDB scan, what it will do is it will allow for that to vary and adjust across space. So it might find lots of very dense clusters in the urban area and then some less dense clusters in the suburban area but they're still clusters um, comparatively in relation to the, the their neighborhood is one way to think about it so um, that's a big difference between db scan and hdb scan and it really just depends on the question that you're asking um, the next one is called optics now, optics is what we call multi-scan i'll i think um, I really love, one of the things I love about optics is that the visuals that we get, the, the, the visualization techniques that we use as part of the output of the tool are actually super helpful in understanding how it works. So the way that you can think about it, we start at, a, at any given point and we measure the distance from that point to its closest neighbor. And then we measure the distance from the next point to its closest neighbor excluding the one that just you just came from. So you go point by point looking for the next closest point and you mark that distance. And then we put all of those distances on what we call a reachability chart. Now this reachability plot helps us understand these features. So those small distances between neighbors are very small distances on our chart. And then the big jumps to the next, when we have a, a long distance, a jump between points that's quite large, those get marked as these peaks in the chart. So we've got these valleys that we can see, and then we've got peaks. Those peaks really represent jumps between clusters. They could also represent noise. So we can see, for instance, that the green group is marked by a valley, and then it's block, it's there's a jump between the green group and the red group by this peak in our reachability plot. Then between the red and the blue, there's a jump to a noise point followed by another jump to the blue group. And so that two, those two jumps to the noise point mark that feature as noise and then find this blue group. Now, one of the things that's really powerful about um, optics is that we can go in here and we can say, okay, I actually wanna fine tune this a little bit. Let's look at the blue group, for instance. Within that blue group, 
there's there's a little peak there. Now it's not a big peak, it's not as big as some of the other peaks, but depending on my application, I may actually want that blue group to be broken up into two separate groups, right? So I can change the sensitivity, there's a parameter in the tool that is the sensitivity, and that's gonna decide how, I mean, more or less that's gonna decide how big that peak has to be to um, differentiate between two clusters. So in this case, we change the sensitivity and now we break up that blue group into a blue, the blue group and a darker green group. And so um, we can see how with optics, we're able to really um, fine tune those results. So just to kind of recap, we've got DB scan, which uses that fixed search distance. It finds clusters of similar densities and it is quite fast. I didn't mention that before, but um, computationally, it's very fast because you've set these parameters that ensure that you don't have to search the entire data set. Kind of the way that the algorithm works is just very quick. Um, then there's HDB scan. So that uses this range of search distances to find clusters of varying densities. It's data driven and it requires the least user input. Um, and then there's optics. So it uses those neighbor distances to create that reachability plot. Um, very flexible for fine tuning, and it is um, it can be the pretty computationally intensive. It's going to be the slowest of these methods, um, but what you get out of it is that that ability to fine tune. So it's really just a balancing act of what what's most important. You know, maybe sometimes I'll start with HDB scan because it's fast, um, faster than optics, let's say, and I can get a kind of a picture of how good of a job it's going to do and if I'm not happy with the results or I think that it needs a little fine-tuning then I'll move on to optics let's say um, so it's kind of where we get into a little bit of the art and the science of this kind of analysis you know there isn't necessarily a right or a wrong method it's just which one's going to give you the results that um, are most appropriate for the question that you're asking the problem that you're trying to solve the data that you have um, so just being aware that these methods exist and some of their pros and cons and the, their strengths and weaknesses is, is useful. All right, so now I'm going to move into a demo. I want to show you guys the um, density-based clustering tool in action. So here what we're looking at is we're in ArcGIS Pro and we're looking at some basketball shot data. So these are shots made by Steph Curry. Um, if we look at this data a little bit, we can see we've got just over 4,500 shots. Um, these are ones that actually were made. We can, this data has all, it's a, it's a really interesting data set. Got, it's got lots of useful information. It's the 4,500 shots that were made between 2011 and 2016. Um, and certainly we can get a, a, a sense of where shots are taken pretty much everywhere. There are some natural clusters that seem really obvious when I just look at it. Um, but what we want to do is start to understand it a little bit better. So we're going to do that using density-based clustering. So we'll start by pointing at that data. And we are going to choose, in this case, I want to, um, I want to explore optics because in my, when I analyzed this data using all of the methods, optics, I really wanted to fine tune it. So I want to explore it a little bit more. So we can... The only thing we have to give it is the minimum number of features per cluster. So that's where we're going to start. There's 4,500 points in this data set. So I'm going to say 100 points um, is going to reflect a cluster, something that I want to be called out as a cluster, a minimum of 100 points. A cluster could have uh, 2,000 points, but I want it to have at least 100 to be considered a cluster. And that's the only parameter that I'm going to give it, and I'm going to run it. So right away, it's going to give me some details about the analysis. So what it does is it goes through and it picks, one of the things that it does is it picks a cluster sensitivity. Now we can see that the cluster sensitivity that it picked here is 41, um, but it says that the second best cl cluster sensitivity here was 99. It also tells us that it created three clusters um, and there, there were only 54 noise features. All right, so that's obviously not the most interesting stuff. Probably that would be the map output. Um, so this is not necessarily what I was hoping the output would look like, 
I see there's these shots over here um, on the left and the right hand side and then pretty much just everything else. And I was hoping to get a better sense of some places where maybe Steph Curry likes to like that that stand out as places from where he's making shots. And this just really isn't giving me much information. So one of the things that I might do is take a look at the reachability chart. Um, so we can see that from this reachability chart, that light blue group actually has a ton of little peaks and valleys in it, but none of them are being picked up based on that cluster sensitivity that was chosen, right? We can see this big peak here found the dark blue area, and then another big peak found the green cluster, but that was it. Those were the only clusters that um, got found, and part of that is that cluster sensitivity that was chosen. So it told us that the cluster sensitivity of 99 was the second best cluster sensitivity. So I'm going to use that 99 and see how that changes my results. So I'll give it a 99 just to remind myself and we'll take a look at the results here. So it's going through, okay. So now we look at the results of that analysis and I think this is probably a lot closer to what I was hoping for, to see some of these natural clusters that exist in that data, but that I was just having trouble seeing when I looked at that raw 4,500 points. So we're seeing, I mean, really we're seeing a bunch of three-point shots from various, um, from various um, kind of angles on the court. Um, unfortunately, this is going to show my... Um, lack of knowledge when it comes to the basketball lingo. I'll leave that to you guys. Um, anyone that's listening who does watch basketball extensively, I'm more of a data nerd. So looking at this data was fascinating to me and I can see some of these patterns popping up. Now, I, I think this is interesting and it really gives us a sense. I just think this is a great example of optics because you can really see that that reachability chart, if we look in here, we can kind of see um, that now with that 99, each of these unique peaks is now finding a different cluster. And so these, these clusters that, were, that weren't kind of um, being pulled out by the algorithm with that initial cluster sensitivity are now being pulled out because we've changed it. Now, the truth is there's still some weird things like what's this cluster here? What, like w there's still a couple places where I feel like maybe... Um, even with that such sensitivity of 99 would be interesting and um, it would be interesting to kind of adjust it. And the truth is whenever I do an analysis like this, I'm usually analyzing it in a lot of different ways. And one of the things that I tried was looking at what happens if I do 100. Um, so we can take a look at the reachability plot and see what that gives us. And we can see that it even found this little cluster in the middle here, um, which interestingly is those uh, shots taken right under the basket. And so if I, I can actually uh, interact with the, the points on the map and the chart, and we can see that those are um, all those shots taken right here. And we can kind of see this movement down the middle of the court, which I thought was really interesting also. So um, there's just so many opportunities, especially when we think about this interaction between a really interesting and sophisticated algorithm like optics integrated with the visualization and data exploration capabilities within ArcGIS Pro to really fine tune and understand this analysis in a way that would be very difficult to do um, otherwise. Now, the only other thing that I want to mention related, I, I guess, specifically to data visualization and exploration is I'm sure many of you have done some sort of density-based clustering before. It's probably one of the most popular um, data-driven machine learning techniques used on spatial data. And there's tons of open source um, packages out there that do things like dbscan and hdbscan. Um, now, for those of you who, who have done this kind of um, density-based clustering, you've probably gone through the usually painful process of trying to visualize the results. Now, when you do density-based clustering, oftentimes you get many, many clusters. In this case, we're not dealing with an immense data set with thousands of clusters, but it's not uncommon to have many clusters. And one of the things that I know I've experienced myself is if I have a hundred clusters and I try to symbolize it, my best bet is to just choose a, uh, um, 
unique value renderer. So I'm just going to pick a hundred random different colors and symbolize each group using a, a one of a hundred random colors. Now the thing is that it's really hard within a hundred colors to create a hundred distinct distinguishable clusters. So inevitably you end up with two reds near each other that look pretty similar, two blues near each other that look pretty similar, and quickly the map is no longer interpretable. So one of the things that we did as part of this output is by default, the output uses something that's based off of what's called the four color theorem. So the four color theorem is basically, it's it comes from the, um, some, it's used often in creating atlases where you don't need each country to have its own color. You just want to make sure that countries that are near each other don't have the same color so that they don't blend together so that you can differentiate between them. So what we use is essentially an eight color theorem. So what we do is it, you'll notice, for instance, that there is a, um, oh, there's a, I wanted to clear the, uh, I wanted to clear the selection here. So what you'll notice is that there's two light blue groups. You've got the light blue group, the light blue group here under the basket, and then the light blue group up here. Those aren't part of the same cluster. They just have the same color. And you'll see in our um, in our table of contents that it's telling us there's two clusters displayed in this color. We can also see that there's two clusters displayed in light pink. Now what this does is we make sure as we're going through and deciding what color everything will be, we go through and make sure, okay, this group, this cluster is orange. Let's make sure that all the clusters near it aren't orange. And we go through and make sure that clusters are given distinct colors. Now that might seem like a minor thing, but if you've ever tried to do this manually, it can be incredibly painful. So little things like automatically creating the the reachability chart automatically symbolizing the, the results are one of the real um, differentiators between doing this kind of analysis um, in ArcGIS Pro and not um, and definitely one of the ways that we try to help you really be as effective and efficient as you can when you're doing this kind of analysis so that you can spend your time understanding your data and not wasting it trying to pick the colors of hundreds of different um, groups Okay, so that is uh, density-based clustering in a nutshell. Um, I could talk about clustering all day long, but we don't have time. So we want to move on to forest-based classification and regression. Um, this is a really exciting tool that we um, have that we're really proud of. It's it brings um, random the random forest algorithm into ArcGIS in a way that is really specifically designed to make it work really well building um, modeling and making predictions using spatial data um, so to go through how forest-based classification and regression works and to show you a demo i'm going to pass it over to my colleague alberto nieto alberto thanks lauren it's always interesting to see that clustering example even if i have no idea about basketball in any case, uh, forest-based classification and regression, before we get started, I do want to clarify that this pertains to the random forest algorithm. Many of you may have already used random forest in Python or R, and this is actually using that random forest algorithm. We just couldn't call it random forest because the name is actually trademarked, even if the algorithm isn't. And one more thing, uh, this tool really is great because it simplifies the use of random forest. In many cases, you can run random forest and many other packages, but I hope this demonstration and the, the concepts that we'll cover show how ArcGIS makes it easier to really run that tool. And that's great because it's quite hard to predict as it turns out. So how do we predict using machine learning and specifically using random forest? Well, the way it works is that we have models and those models need training data in order to predict. Training data can pertain to samples that have characteristics that are well associated with the thing that we want to predict. So in this example, we have dogs and we want to train a model to predict dog breed. And we have explanatory variables pertaining to the size, the color, the fur, the ears, the tail, the age, and the weight. And those explanatory variables may have good relationships with the dog breed that can help this model train and eventually predict 
accurately. Now, the way that random forest works is by creating decision trees. Decision trees work by splitting your data for each variable according to how useful those variables are in determining dog breed. For example, this is one such decision tree. We have one dog, a dachshund, and the first explanatory variable that we will split by is by the size. Then the decision tree makes a decision. This is a small dog, so we'll go down that particular branch. Then we'll bring in another explanatory variable, color. This is a dark dog, so we'll go down that particular branch. The next variable is ears, and that lets us finally determine that this sample must be a dachshund. That's the only type of, of uh, pattern that we can find down this branch. Now, random forest works with an ensemble of decision trees, hence the name forest. And each tree receives a subset of all the training data and also a subset of the variables that are used in each tree. And in this example, in the first decision tree on the left, figured out that weight is a particular uh, explanatory variable to split by. So it used weight, then color, then fur, then tail, and correctly predicted that we have a dachshund. However, the second decision tree started trying to split using color. And color may not be a particularly useful explanatory variable for breed, so it ultimately determined the wrong breed. So these decision trees individually may not be strong predictors, but random forest works with a majority vote concept. All of the trees will vote on the dog breed to predict, and by having the majority vote determine the dog breed, you actually build a strong predictor out of several weak predictors. Now, random forest can be used to predict in terms of classification, so uh, a categorical variable, this could be the presence or absence of a disease, uh, the type of crime that you may have, the cause of a forest fire, the distribution of a species or land cover classification, or perhaps dog breed. We can also work with continuous variables, so numerical values that uh, may pertain to, for example, healthcare spending or crime rates mortality rates, rates of disease, or sales profits. And the way we can express those explanatory variables is through three specific types of parameters, attributes, distance features, and rasters. Attributes are generally how we think about explanatory variables, which is in a table. You may have explanatory variables that are fields in a table and that table also has your, your known breed for your dogs. So you can simply point to the fields that contain the explanatory training variables. However, the tool can also let you pass other features to calculate distances, which is extremely useful for data engineering. Uh, for instance, if you're trying to predict the sale price of a home and you understand that the home's proximity to the coastline may really help you predict. Instead of running several tools ahead of time to calculate the distances to the coastline or to the beach, this tool actually can calculate that for you by letting you pass another feature class corresponding to the coastline. So it's quite useful. If you have training rasters or rasters that represent an explanatory variable, you can also use them um, and use them as explanatory variables in your prediction model. You can also create a prediction surface if all of your explanatory variables are prediction rasters, or are rasters, rather. When you run the tool, you have three ways to predict, or three ways to really execute the tool. The first one is called train only. The second one is predict to features, and finally, predict to rasters. And train only is used to assess the model performance. It's very often the first way that we execute the tool. We may want to first assess how accurate the models are or how, how performant the particular model is before we try to use it to predict. Predictive features are is a, is a method that we would use once we're 
more confident about a method, about a model, and we have explanatory variables that seem to be performing well using train only. In this case, we expand how many parameters are used in the tool and you pass essentially where you want to predict and you just need to match the explanatory variables for that features, for those features where you want to predict. Finally, predict a raster would be if you want to create that prediction surface. And in this case, all the explanatory variables must be rasters. Uh, and it can be used, for example, to create a land cover classification surface, among others. A very important part of modeling, and especially with random forest, is to evaluate the model performance. One such diagnostic that you get from this tool is the ability to determine the variable importance. So which variables were most useful in the decision trees that the random forest built? Uh, something to keep in mind is that this may not necessarily correspond to direct relationships between explanatory variables and your prediction or your variable that you want to predict. They often are, but this is likely not the tool to use if you want to examine linear relationships, for example. Another diagnostic that you get is out-of-bag errors. Uh, for example, in each tree, you get a subset of the training data. Uh, for example, two-thirds of the training data. But that third that was excluded will still be passed through that decision tree, and we will assess how did that tree do with the data that it was never able to see during training. Uh, you get a diagnostic every time you run the tool to see how the decision trees performed across the board in that excluded data set. Another diagnostic that is quite helpful when you're trying to determine if you have a performant model is model validation. So you have all of your training features, and by default, the tool will hold back 10% of all those training features. So during training, the 90% that is uh, remains that or that remains in training is actually used to build those splits and to build the decision trees and then 10 percent is used to validate how does the model do on data that it has never seen before finally if we're using regression or if we're trying to predict continuous values you get an r squared diagnostic that measures how far your predicted value is from the observed value if you're doing classification, you receive a confusion matrix, and the confusion matrix can be helpful to determine how well the model is predicting a particular class. And it's also important to notice that uh, classification gets a bit more complex, in my personal opinion, because you don't just care about um, finding the class, but you also perhaps care about uh, not having false positives or false negatives. Um, one of the diagnostics that you receive with this confusion matrix is sensitivity. So for example, if you look at this diagram, the model predicted dachshund eight times. And out of 10 total, um, or basically the, the model predicted eight out of 10. So it is sensitivity of 80% and it gives you a sense of how well the model is finding a particular class. But another diagnostic that you may be able to use is accuracy. And accuracy also cares about the times that the model correctly did not predict dachshund. So in this case, the model correctly predicted 15 out of 20 times, and accuracy in this case would be 75%. So these two different diagnostics may be helpful for different purposes. Now, modeling is not necessarily following a cooking list, but this is basically a series of steps that you should consider at the very least um, in your path to creating a prediction model. Uh, in our first attempts to document this type of procedure, we missed that crucial step of preparing your data. Uh, so we have it as step zero because it is crucial in everything we do with modeling and prediction. And very often it's the steps that take the longest time. So it is indeed uh, important to have good data and to understand your data upfront, because that can very often make all the difference between having a good model, regardless of the type of algorithm. But then you do uh, 
go through the process of training a model and evaluating model performance, perhaps through those diagnostics that I shared. And you may want to train again with different parameters and compare models. Now, repeat has an infinity sign, and it seems almost like a joke, but it's also not a joke. Um, very often, modeling is never this perfect land at the final model that you love. It's almost like you're fighting and you're being persistent and building a case slowly. And um, it's not until you find this one answer that that stands to, to criticism through several different perspectives that you're happy. Uh, so you have to be at, you have to be persistent and, and not essentially expect the perfect answer all the time. Modeling is much more difficult than many other types of workflows. So with that, let's take a look at a demonstration. And in this demonstration, we're going to take a look at a topic that is quite important this year, voter participation in the United States for presidential elections. What we're looking at here is a data set of counties across the United States and voter turnout, or how many people went to vote that are eligible to vote for the presidential election in 2016. Uh, counties in green had high voter participation and counties in purple had low voter participation. So what we would like to do is create a prediction model that can take this county data set as training and predict at the tract level, which is much more granular and see if we can get more detail for voter participation so that we could perhaps determine who to reach out to and who to inform about upcoming elections to raise voter participation across the country. Um, so one of the things that we can do is run forest-based classification and regression. So here's the tool. Here's the prediction type train only. We'll keep it as such. And to run the tool, it's actually quite straightforward. I think it's very valuable that Random Forest is easy to run. It is a complex algorithm in many ways, but it's the, the way you execute it should not be difficult. The, the difficulty in prediction is being an analyst and thinking critically about the problem, right? So we'll make it simple. We'll simply specify the variable to predict as voter turnout. And just like that, actually, we can specify some training variables. So we'll select a few different ones. According to literature on voter turnout, uh, age is a very strong predictor, as well as per capita income and education. So we'll select uh, high school dropouts, education, uh, people that went to high school but didn't receive a diploma. And finally, we'll also select maybe uh, one more variable just to test owning a selfie stick, which we curiously have data for. So just like that, we can run the tool and we have produced a random forest model. Now it didn't produce an output because I there's a lot of optional parameters, but just this is just to illustrate how straightforward it is to actually run a random forest model. Uh, in Python or R, you may be used to seeing a much more complex uh, process to actually receive that. So these are the diagnostics of the model, and I do recommend that every time you run the tool, you hover over the output details and look at these messages. The messages contain all of those diagnostics that we talked about. So the first set of uh, diagnostics, it gives you a sense of the model characteristics, how many trees were used, the out of bag errors. If you recall, these are the, this is the subset of the data that the trees don't see. And we can see that the percent of variation is only around 50%, which is not terribly great. However, we do have to keep in mind that Different domains have different expectations for prediction. So medicine or a pharmaceutical company may have a much more high uh, expectation for, for R squared or for percent of variation explained. Social sciences, such as voter participation or human behavior, are much trickier to model. So something a bit less uh, performant is actually sometimes fine for the purposes that we're trying to use it for. Nevertheless, this is not a great model yet, so we do need to iterate and refine. So I want to show you some of the diagnostics to help us jump off. The first one is top variable importance. So we can see here that the most important variables are per capita income, education, uh, high school no diploma, so high school dropouts, and age. And owning a selfie stick was the least important out of these four variables. So you can get a sense of what's helping and what's not. Now for the training data, so this is the 90% of the data that the model used. 
Now R squared is actually quite high, but you should be looking at the validation data, the 10% that was excluded from training to really assess how your model is performing because they can be quite different as you can see. So 0 0.43, even though this is social data, I think we can do a little bit better. Finally, there's uh, one more diagnostic here at the bottom that is quite important, and this is the explanatory variable range diagnostics. This pertains to how much of the, for the validation subset, the 10%, what type of training data is it seeing when it's trying to predict? So what you should be aware of is that random forest is not good at extrapolating or trying to predict in areas where the training data is much different or where the explanatory variable ranges are much different. So we should see where we're trying to predict, we should see ranges that the tool has seen before during training. And this validation share gives you a sense of whether that's the case or not. Typically, a good rule of thumb is that these values shouldn't exceed one because that means that the, ver that the model is trying to predict in areas that it's never really seen before, or it's never seen those variables for uh, ranges before. It also shouldn't be too low, uh, and we'll see examples of where that can happen. So those are the diagnostics, and I want to run the tool quite a few more times to give you a sense of how we can make it a bit easier to interpret the results and kind of get to a better model. So the first thing I want to do is expand this additional outputs uh, option and actually produce some output features. So I'm going to just say out train features here. And we're also going to produce, produce an out variable importance table. Whoops, there we go. And all this does is essentially produces two outputs every time we run the model. First, it's going to be our counties uh, as training features. And also we're going to get a table of which variables were important. So you know you now have um, essentially how the model would predict to the training data, essentially the counties. And it's symbolized here. Dark green means higher voter turnout. But more importantly, uh, down here at the bottom, you will see an out variable importance table, and it comes with a chart. And this chart can be a bit more helpful if you're trying to see which variables were more important in predicting. So you can see education, per capita income, and median age were the three big ones. Owning a selfie stick, not so much. So going back to the drawing board, let's keep refining this. One of the things that we perhaps want to do is get rid of owning a selfie stick. That's not helping quite so much. But uh, there's some other characteristics that can help us. So keep note of the R squared, first of all. The R squared for this model happens to be about, let's see. If we go back to our history, it's about 0 0.43. So let's see if we can improve that a little bit. Notice that there's this parameter for explanatory training distance features, and we do happen to have some information that can help us there. So we have these distance variables, and they pertain to cities. So particularly what it shows is cities of different sizes. So we may have really large cities in the United States, cities 10, uh, second largest cities, third, fourth, smaller, and smallest. So what we can do is essentially pass all of these as different features or explanatory variables to the tool. And what the tool will do, let's go ahead and run it. The tool will essentially calculate the distance between every single county and each of those different classes of cities and use that as an explanatory variable during prediction. Now the tool takes a little bit longer to run because it is calculated distances and producing a table that can be used for the random forest model. So a good best practice is to actually use the output of the of this model and use those fields uh, that it produces from that calculation of distance as explanatory training variables, as fields essentially, so that it doesn't have to calculate them every time. So let's see how we did. We have now passed distances and first of all, we see quite an improvement in R squared for validation data from 0 0.4 to about 0 0.63 through the addition of geography, of location and distances. Now, these were not the most important variables, but they are certainly helping the model from what we see down here in R squared. Um, and we can keep going further. So for example, if we want to incorporate not just the distance to cities, but we may also want to incorporate additional uh, 
information about voting. For example, this is a, a, a variable that pertains to voting requirement laws. Whether you need a, a photo ID in the particular state or whether voting uh, requirement laws are much more lenient. So according to literature, this is a very important variable in participation in voting. So what we can do is basically, I'm going to drag and drop this new data set that has that field to our input training features, and we can select that here. It's called state voting requirement laws. And you will see that the checkbox for categorical was automatically selected. That means that this is a categorical variable. It's not a continuous variable. It's five categories. And we can easily incorporate that into our model. Now, one more thing that I want to do along the way is also change validation options here at the bottom. So this is allowing us to set not just how much percent of the data is excluded for validation, but we can also tell the tool to run more than one time and assess performance across all of those runs. So we're going to tell the tool to run 10 times. And I'm also going to check that uh, final parameter to calculate uncertainty. So I'll establish the name of our output validation table for the 10 runs and let the tool execute. So this can be very useful for random forest because random forest can sometimes be or can often be different from run to run, uh, particular, particularly because each decision tree gets a different random subset of the training data and of the variables. Some of the results can actually differ across different runs. So it's, a, it's another best practice to run several times and get a diagnostic for how your model is performing. So here you see the, the model running 10 times, and now we have our output and we can assess our performance. So very gradually, we're making a little bit of progress each time, and I do want you to get the sense that it's not, it's a very iterative process, and you have to just keep, <laughs> keep uh, making small steps towards what you find may help. Okay, so let's see. Uh, first of all, we get, uh, because I check calculate uncertainty, you get a new prediction interval. And this prediction interval actually gives you a sense of where you can trust the model or not. It gives you a sense of confidence intervals. So these ranges can be different between low uh, predicted turn voter turnout values and high predicted voter turnout values. And we can see a pretty consistent spread from the lowest to the highest at this point. So it's actually, um, I guess the really the takeaway here would be that if you see a wider distribution between the high confidence interval, the 95, and the lowest voter turnout interval, about zero or 0 0.05, then that means that in those ranges, the model is a little bit harder to trust because it's not quite as certain that the value should be a particular value. Right here, it's across the board pretty pretty similar, so, so nothing too bad there. Uh, because we ran the model 10 times, you also get a validation R-squared table. And what this gives you a sense is how is the R-squared changing across all of those 10 runs? So you can see it can be as high as 0 0.69, or it can actually be as low as 0 0.57. So um, another best practice is to take a look at this to actually assess what's a good R-squared for your current model. One final thing is that you, also, you don't just get a bar chart for your variable importance anymore. Since you ran it 10 times, you get a distribution of the variable importance across the 10 runs. And that can be really important if you're trying to assess if certain variables are flipping or if you're trying to determine between one variable and another, if these box charts overlap, it can be kind of tougher to actually determine that one is more important than the other. So education and per capita income are actually both quite important for the model. Sometimes one can beat the other, but those two are certainly much better predictors than median age and then even some of the distances and state voting requirement laws. So we're making incremental progress. Uh, Another, an important part of predicting is really to do a lot of research on the problem. So another part of this is uh, how competitive is the election in a particular state. And in this case, what we did is we brought in one more variable for state voter uh, percent votes difference between the two parties. And you can simply uh, find that data, incorporate it into the model and express it as a field, which is what we're doing here.
So what we'll do is find uh, the state percent votes difference, run the model one more time with that variable and see how our diagnostics are changing as we're introducing these additional variables. Now, a very important part of random forest that makes it, in my opinion, easier to use than a lot of the traditional linear regression methods is that you don't need to necessarily worry about multicollinearity, where multiple variables may be telling the same story. And that's really because of how random forest uh, operates. It's not going to have those, those typical issues that you would run into with multicollinearity with generalized linear regression, for example. So we have the outputs. Let's take a look at how we did in this case. Uh, we have made gains. We're now almost at 0 0.7. And we're seeing that state percent votes difference did make a difference, no pun intended. And we can use that in our prediction model. Now, what I was saying about essentially passing a lot of variables that tell the same story and not having to worry as much about multicollinearity really comes to bear when we try to pass a lot more variables. So what I could do is look at all the other fields that I have in my data set, check them all, remove the ones that we already had because we don't want duplicates. So we had median age per capita income. We also had, um, we don't need county, we don't need FIPS. Uh, we can keep owning a selfie stick even if we want to keep using it. We don't need these and we don't want to use voter turnout to predict voter turnout. That might be cheating. So we have everything at this point. Let me make sure that we don't have any duplicates. And I think we do have one duplicate here. So let's see what the tool tells us. Uh, educational attainment. So it's the high school one. There we go. So now we have a lot of variables. And what we can do is we have all of those variables and let's see how much of a gain we make. Now that's a lot of data and something to keep in mind as you do start experimenting with different models is that the more you do, the more complexity you add the, to the model, the harder it is to defend and explain and understand, right? So just because you can add 20 or 30 explanatory variable fields doesn't necessarily mean you should. I'm doing this because it is part of that exploratory process of seeing what works and what doesn't. So what we will see is, is actually a big gain in R squared, but we, to some degree, we lose some of the simplicity of the earlier methods or earlier models. And you do have to kind of think critically about whether that's something that you want to do or not. In our case, once we're done executing here, I think it's just about done with the 10th run of the model. I do want to show you how this example finally turned out. Okay, so there's our output. Let's take a look at our diagnostics. And yeah, we've made a lot of gains. We have R squared at 0 0.739, which sounds quite good. Uh, however, you once again do have to be careful because we've added a lot of complexity to this model. We have a lot of variables and some of them are certainly helpful and this can help you determine if maybe there's some stuff that we were missing before that we would certainly keep even if we remove some of these. Like the amount of households below poverty level, that seems to matter quite a bit for this model. Uh, something that we may want to check on here and there is the exploratory variable range diagnostics and make sure that these aren't getting out of hand. Essentially, I'm looking at this last column and making sure that these aren't above one. There's a few that can be above one, but um, it doesn't have to be a strict rule. So finally, uh, the last run of the model that I'll show you is when we switch from train only to predict to features. And by doing that, what we're doing is we're actually exposing a lot of additional parameters down here at the bottom. So these are all new. Input prediction features would have to be your tracks, right? So these are the tracks across the country. You can pass those to input prediction features. You would have to specify your out predicted features. Whoops. And I would name it tracks. Then you just have to match the median age for, or the explanatory variable names for every single parameter. And then finally run the tool. 
It might take a little bit longer, so for the sake of time, I just want to show you a little bit of the final outputs. Something that you do want to keep in mind is that uh, while it might not be a bad idea to try to predict using the entire tracks data set, you do want to take a look at the output prediction intervals. So one problem that you could have is that your uncertainty intervals could get out of hand uh, when you start predicting. So you do want to be careful that for something like this, where we care about low voter turnout, that these ranges don't get much higher and much lower for the P95 and P05 intervals. So in our case, we ended up landing, uh, we did do it at the national level, but we found that a much more stable model where the uncertainty wasn't so great at the lower voter turnout values really could only be attained for Iowa. So it, it stands to tell that even after all that work, uh, really the places where we were more confident about this model performing well, ended up being just for one particular state for some set of variables. So much more work would have to be done on a state-by-state -state basis to predict comfortably. And what this would finally tell us to really link it back to the real world is it would maybe highlight some tracks where people are expected to uh, vote in much lower quantities. So in this case, I selected a particular track that was the lowest in all of Iowa. And this is by a, a city called Sioux City. That could be a place where you might organize a get out the vote campaign or if you forecast in the next election, you may want to understand why is it that those tracks seem to be not participating as much as the rest. I do want to encourage you to, uh, to really work with domain experts when you predict because that is crucial. Um, many of us are GIS experts or developers that really know about Python or or syntax and code, but the phenomena and the scientists that work to solve those problems, I think are crucial when you start getting into prediction. So with that demonstration and that uh, explanation of random forest, now I'm gonna hand it back to you, Lauren. Thank you so much, Alberto. Um, so I just wanna finish up by saying that we've got a ton of resources. Um, at the time that these um, are out, the spatial data science MOOC will have already happened. Hopefully some of you were able to be part of that MOOC. I will say that those MOOCs get run over and over again. So if you didn't get a chance to be part of that MOOC this time, um, I highly recommend joining for the next run. Um, actually that data that Alberto just showed us is the data set that you'll get a chance to play around with um, for exploring um, data engineering, data visualization, and prediction during that MOOC. So that's a really good opportunity that you should look out for. Um, in the meantime, we've got a ton of hands-on resources. If you go to learn.arcgis.com, you will find um, all sorts of step-by-step -step walkthroughs about how to do everything from really simple, you know, web map creation all the way up to modeling, um, seagrass health across uh, globally. So lots of different types of lessons available um, for everything from the simple to the most sophisticated um, things that you might be trying to do. And I highly recommend those. And then finally, if you go to esriurl.com slash spatial stats, we've got a ton of resources there. We've got even more in-depth um, looks at random forest, at regression analysis, kind of a, a traditional regression analysis. We've got clustering, hotspot analysis, and more some of the more traditional spatial statistics um, applications, spatiotemporal modeling, um, lots of different um, workshops that you can watch and learn more about how these methods work, uh, as well as some uh, links to some of the hands-on um, workflows that are specific to these methods. And um, a lot of other resources available there. So definitely check that out as well. Um, so with that, I wanna thank you for joining us and uh, hopefully you feel like you were able to unpack the black box of some of these um, methods and feel like you're ready to kind of hit the ground running and get started using them. So thanks again and we'll see you soon. Bye.